Hear this loud and clear. Meditation is good. Originally produced in cooperation with Yoga One Studios, this is one in a series of practices about mindfulness meditation, yoga philosophy, and the art of accepting uncertainty. Today's session focuses on a concept called autopilot, followed by a practice called embodiment. I'm Steve from Steve White Yoga, bringing you the application of yoga to manage your health, take control of your life, and improve your relationships. Here's today's session. Practice that's titled mindfulness. Mindfulness can be a lot of different things. Sort of in the modern vernacular, what mindfulness uh, uh, is in sort of the popular notion is a series of practices that uh, primarily spring out of Buddhism. And um, but the Buddhists like don't have copyright to it or anything. Mindfulness goes back farther than Buddhism goes, actually. Mindfulness, in fact, um, as best we know, was first established in the yoga world uh, before Buddhism even existed. So uh, in any event, these are practices that, with a modern spin, have come to be um, accessible for most people. Uh, especially those who quake in their boots at the uh, mention of the word meditation, and not just accessible, accessible but um, incredibly applicable, particularly in times like we're experiencing right now where there's a lot of change, there's a lot of uncertainty. And the other thing about mindfulness um, that can be very useful, and we'll get an experience of this actually on Thursday, we did it last Thursday as well, is that you can um, direct certain issues concerns, uh, um, obstacles in your life through a mindfulness practice and come out with some really good results. So this stuff is proven, it's effective, it's um, been going on for thousands of years without the benefit of uh, YouTube or of Zoom. And um, so we'll get a little bit of experience of it today. I'm gonna try and bring up uh, a little PowerPoint presentation here. Okay. So uh, there are sort of two themes for today. One is the one we'll talk about, which will take maybe 10 minutes or so, and then our practice will constitute the last 15 or uh, maybe a little bit more minutes. Uh, so uh, the, the, the topic for today is called, uh, uh, is called autopilot. And this is the modern application of a term that comes from yoga called samskara, if you're interested. That's the Sanskrit word. So what autopilot represents is um, the way that we typically interact with the world and in fact, the way that we typically deal with our own uh, experience, internal experience, which is to say we're, we're creatures of habit. We talked about this a little bit last time. And um, you know, when, so when we talk about a sub subject like mindfulness, like bringing our mind to one place for a period of time, we're really going against like 5 million years of human evolution or the evolution of the brain in any event, which has dictated that we uh, exercise vigilance, we look for danger, and we anticipate what could happen next that um, might put us as organisms in danger. Does this sound familiar to you at all, uh, given the current times? So we're, what we're, we're proposing doing is taking the brain and um, sort of heading it gently, but purposefully in a different direction so that our experience of the world can be revised to become more, let's say, palatable. Uh, it's not any, um, it's not any uh, surprise that we have a nervous system, but it is actually a nervous system. So what we're trying to do here uh, in mindfulness is to take the nervous system and um, give it a little bit of a tune-up. And that can be done through a regular practice uh, over the course of days, weeks, certainly, months, absolutely. We can start to change the way that we perceive and interact with the world. And so that's, uh, that's the idea. 
So we've, uh, for those of you who have been with me before uh, for these sessions, you've already seen this. I'll run through it relatively quickly. But if this is fairly new to you, if mindfulness is something you've never experienced before, or if this um, particular brand is not uh, something that you're familiar with, here are some quick definitions of mindfulness. There are lots of them. Um, mindfulness is intentional. So we're doing it uh, on purpose. It's experiential. We're looking to find our experience of it rather than presupposing what that experience is going to be. It's non-judgmental. Um, it, it includes what we call a window of tolerance. So uh, this is having an experience without immediately coming to, to some conclusion about it, without saying, I'm not doing this right, without saying, um, this doesn't seem well seem right to me, without saying, wow, I'm a really good meditator today. We're just there to have the experience non-judgmentally and to watch it. And um, from one of the purveyors, modern purveyors of this uh, mindfulness practice, uh, a guy named John Kabat-Zinn, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So that comprises mindfulness. Um, we talked about this uh, last session on Thursday, and I'll just again run through it relatively quickly. They uh, have, there's, there's just a, a huge body of evidence, something like 2,000 uh, published studies at this point on the effects of meditation on the brain. And this is just one because it uh, kind of brings to the forefront how effective this stuff is. Uh, and an eight week study was done of, um, I think it was 20 or 25 students for a, uh, using a meditation practice of 20 to 30 minutes per day for eight weeks. And as a result of that, uh, they measured um, certain uh, markers in the brain. Um, there was a reduction in the size of the primitive brain, which is responsible for our fight, flight, fright response. And there was increasing uh, density for emotional regulation, for executive decision-making, uh, for uh, empathy and creativity. So out with the bad, in with the good is sort of the lesson that we learned. And uh, so this is demonstrated by science. Of course, I've known this for you know, thousands of years, in the, uh, particularly in the Eastern world. So uh, today we're going to talk for just a couple of minutes about uh, a subject called uh, living on autopilot. So the idea of living on autopilot is that um, we live on autopilot when we brush our teeth. A lot of times when we're driving our car. Um, if you're a musician and you've trained yourself to sight read, you're on autopilot when you're sight reading. Um, when somebody hurts our feelings and we lash out at them, that's autopilot. Um, when we pick up our, our device, our phone or whatever, every five minutes to check our texts or email or posts or whatever, this is autopilot. It applies even more specifically to what a lot of people seem to be doing as a response to our current circumstances, which is to be checking the news all the time in some fashion or another. So we fall into this um, realm of autopilot and this is just how we sort of function in the world. Uh, and a lot as has been demonstrated by studies, a lot of our behaviors, how we think, how we feel, how we act, are all based on this um, idea of autopilot with relatively little conscious input that directs how we're thinking, how we're feeling, how we're acting. And so meditation, this mindfulness practice, gives us an opportunity to begin to change this over time through regular practice. So I, I will say that autopilot isn't really, in, in and of itself, it's not good or bad. Um, you can be on autopilot and be sure to wish everybody a happy birthday who you have some familiarity with. Um, you can be on autopilot and um, buy flowers for someone who's in the hospital because that's just what you do and who you are. So it isn't that it's bad to have habits. It's that some of our habits are um, much more functional and some of our habits are much, le much less functional. And the uh, curious thing is that in times like these, the less functional habits tend to come to the forefront uh, much more evidently, more, much more um, uh, firmly. 
And so it's a good time from that perspective to be engaging in a practice that can start to examine these habits and uh, ultimately to start to make adjustments. So uh, in autopilot, we act and react based on uh, our own conditioning, uh, our past circumstances, our, uh, how we grew up, what kind of experiences we have, particularly traumatic experiences. And um, you, know, you could throw an element or two of DNA in there as well, but they form our habits. Um, in the yoga world, as I mentioned earlier, the term is samskara, which represents this phenomenon. And habitual habits, or excuse me, habitual thoughts, feelings, and actions, which make up a large portion of our conscious lives, are this living on autopilot. Um, and this is a quote from uh, one of my teachers, Gary Kraftso. And um, he says, what's stronger, your habits or your intentions? This may not come as any surprise to you. Uh, how often in your life have you... Um, intended on doing something and your procrastination kept it from happening or happening in a timely manner or maybe even happening at all. So, you know, we're all human beings and this is sort of the programming that we're subject to as a species. But uh, fortunately, unlike uh, lions or chimpanzees, we do have the ability to um, sort of reprogram ourselves. And that's what we'll be learning about today. So these are the anchors. Now, uh, a quick word about anchors. Anchors are something that we use in meditation practice and mindfulness practice as uh, a basis for starting the practice. So there are three that are offered in mindfulness that are the, sort of the primary ones. And they are the, um, to use sound, to use the breath, or to use sensation. Those are the three. And we'll be having experience in just a moment of that. Uh, and I'm going to turn this off and ask you, wherever you are, to um, find a comfortable space where you can sit upright. And it's best if, uh, if you're sitting in a chair or on a couch or something, it's best if you sit up so you're not your, your back is not pressed against, uh, um, against a support unless you need it um, for your own purposes uh, to uh, uh, support a bad back or something. All right. Almost back to even. Okay, great. All right. So as you get settled in, um, you know, feel like your posture is awake. Awake, but at ease. Go ahead and close your eyes. If your feet are on the floor, I would suggest putting both your feet firmly on the floor as opposed to uh, crossed ankles or crossed legs. And just feel yourself sitting here. Have an experience of sitting. And let your senses be awake. Listen. Feel your breath. Try listening to your body from the inside out. You might feel your heartbeat. The action of the breath. You might be able to sense your bones. Now begin to scan through your body with awareness. 
And where you find tension, just relax a bit. Relax and receive the life that's there. You might notice your shoulders or your jaw, your neck or your forehead, your eyes. Feel sensation from the inside out and let go. You might imagine that any tension is turning from ice to water and from water to vapor. And then change your focus and feel the energy in your arms. Feel sensation. And then make an easy and effortless transition to bring awareness to your hands and fingers. When you soften your hands, notice what you feel from the inside out. You might sense tingling or buzzing or vibration. Air temperature. Temperature of your skin, pressure. As you relax even more, can you notice whether you are receiving more aliveness, a more intimate sense of presence from your hands? Allow your chest to be open and move your awareness to your belly. And then let each breath be received into a softening belly. Again. And again. And again. Find your awareness traveling to the contact that you have with a chair or a cushion or a floor, whatever you're sitting on. Feel your legs from the inside out. Hold your awareness in your feet. And again, receive sensations from the inside. Soften even more. Can you widen your attention to feel uh, your body as a field of sensation, the whole body? Not stopping or controlling anything, just allowing and watching and listening.
receiving the breath, relax with the inflow. Relax with the outflow. Can you have the experience of your breath being in the foreground, but it's bathed in this feeling, this feeling of aliveness, of hereness, a feeling of energy, like like a field of energy. If you notice that your mind has drifted into thoughts, just simply direct your awareness back to the body. You might start again, the shoulders, the hands, the chest, the belly. Notice your contact with the environment. Continue to allow the breath to move within this field of awareness, this field of presence. As your mind wanders, you might bring it back to listen again moment, um, uh, moment by moment to sounds. Notice the sounds you experience. And accept them without question, without analysis. With that same receptivity, listen to and feel the sensations of the body. Stay within this moment and know that we have experienced three different anchors, sensation, either in the body or as part of your environment, breath, and sound. Perhaps one of these spoke most particularly to you, which is to say was easiest to work with. If so, We'll spend just a couple of minutes in silence using whichever anchor you choose, sound, sensation, or breath, as the foundation for practice. And as your mind wanders, and it will, just notice that and bring it back to rest in the anchor. Each time your mind leaves, just gently direct it back. Find the anchor. 
It may rest there for a beat, for a second, for a moment. Each time your mind moves, just direct it back again and again and again. And then relax your effort. So some people, you know, have a reasonably pleasant experience of this if you're relatively new to meditation. Some people, this is absolute agony. If it's absolutely agony, you join a big club of people. Um, it's not uncommon. Which is why we suggest that a beginning practice only has to be a few minutes. Cumulatively, even if you struggle with this, even if it's really, really hard for you, cumulatively, the effect of doing this is really quite phenomenal. Uh, I often tell the story of when I started my own meditation practice, which was at a particularly poor period of my life. I think it was in 2001. And uh, within a matter of weeks, uh, I would have credited meditation with saving my life. And I'm not sure that that was literal. I'm not sure I was necessarily suicidal, but I was very unhappy and very lost. Uh, so my encouragement is to give this stuff a chance, even if it doesn't feel like you're doing it right, or like it's not doing any good, or like you're never going to be any good at this because your mind moves too much. Um, I've been teaching meditation for probably six or seven years now. And I've heard about every excuse in the book, um, including I have ADHD and I can't uh, focus for more than five seconds. And there's a myriad of, of reasons people say that they can't do it. But the fact is that if you're doing it, then you're doing it. So it's your decision. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's not a matter of good or bad. It's a matter of whether you decide that this is going to be something that you commit to or not. It's as simple as that. And I'd suggest committing to it. All right. So uh, you have a couple of notes here, one of which is that um, this session will be available to you. Meg will be sending out an email sometime uh, later today, presumably, with a link. That link is to a recording of the session. And you are more than welcome to view that. It will be up for a week. So um, if this was helpful and beneficial and you want to try it again, you're more than willing uh, or more than welcome rather to do that. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of resources. Let's see if I can share my screen again and make this work great. Okay. So if you're interested in the whole sort of process of meditation from a Western perspective, uh, a really good book is called Buddha's Brain by Dr. Richard Hansen. Uh, and some people like to know the nitty, gr nitty gritty of this stuff and it's a, it's a good resource. There's tons of them because there's so much information now on meditation uh, and meditative practices. But um, this is a particularly good one actually that a student of mine once recommended to me and, and I really liked it. So 
Um, it's very readable. It's not too long. It's not too technical. And um, it can be helpful for some people to appreciate that there's um, a firm foundation for doing this stuff. Um, if you're looking for a mobile app, uh, there's one called Insight Timer, which is available for Android and iPhone, and it is uh, has a lot of free content on it. If you um, choose to download it and you go to, you just, you know, there's a search uh, function on it like everything else in the world. And if you uh, just type in mindfulness, you'll come up with a zillion practices. It's all different kinds of teachers at all different levels. Frankly, some of them um, that I've seen, I probably wouldn't recommend to friends, but uh, it, so it does take a little bit of searching, but uh, uh, you can search by topic within the uh, realm of mindfulness. And so uh, some people like that approach of having a regular guided practice from somebody, and you might be able to connect with something there. Um, if you have, uh, there's, as I said, a zillion apps, and if you already have one that works for you and you like it, then I don't necessarily recommend adding on to that. Um, I'm not a tremendous fan in this realm of just jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing. And um, I prefer settling on something for a while and letting it do its work on you rather than just, you know, kind of jumping around for the next best thing or looking for the perfect thing or whatever the case might be. Um, and then in the, um, in the realm of uh, shameless self-promotion, I have a YouTube channel called Steve White Yoga. And there is a recent installment there called Three Easy Practices for Hard Times. These are not specifically uh, mindfulness practices. In fact, they're breathing practices. If you've done yoga for a long time, you might be familiar with one or all of them. But uh, the power of, uh, of altering the way that you breathe uh, in the interest of improving your condition is spectacular. The research is a little weak in the Western world, but the, um, the uh, uh, evidence comes from practitioners, including myself, who've done uh, breathing practices for uh, a long time and found tremendous results. So feel free to check that out if you want. And then uh, I will also um, just promote one more thing, which is if you are interested in yoga from the standpoint of the deeper practices of yoga, and this is a system that's thousands of years old. Um, it started as a meditative system, essentially. And um, what we do in classes today was just is just one small aspect of a very, very large uh, b uh, body of work. I hope you got value out of today's session. For more information and practices, visit me on my YouTube channel, Steve White Yoga, or find me at www.stevewhiteyoga.com. See you next time.